Spinosaurids in the fossil record are really annoying, because overall they're fairly partial and they've had a lot of debate around them, specifically around how they probably fed, whether they were wading or whether or not they were diving through the water. And this paper was trying to solve some of that question, but not directly whether or not they were swimming in the water or wading. Instead, it was more looking at how the jaws would have functioned. And they did this with a few different measurements and compared those measurements to what we find in modern day crocodilians. Now, first off, we need to consider there's two different groups of Spinosaurids. There's the Baryonychines and the Spinosaurines. The Spinosaurines being more like Spinosaurus and the Baryonychines being more like Baryonyx. And you can really see the difference in their jaw morphologies in this figure, with the Spinosaurine on the left and the Baryonychines on the right. And you can see there's differences in the number of teeth and the size of the teeth. You can also see the Spinosaurines have this very large rosette of teeth at the tip of their snout, as opposed to the much smaller rosette that you see in Baryonychines. Many different traits of these were plotted against one another, including AAA, or the average alveolar area, which is just essentially how big is the tooth socket. Pretty straightforward on that one. That area and other measurements were then plotted with things like the head width and even the rosette width in order to better understand where they might fit in as far as general morphology with modern day crocodilians. And this is important, modern day crocodilians also have at least somewhat rosettes at the tip of their snouts and elongated snouts the way that we see in Spinosaurus. Not necessarily saying they hunted the same way, but at least the skull morphology is similar. These graphs show the results of those comparisons, and you can see a few specific trends. For example, Baryonychines group pretty tightly together in most of these graphs, at least for the ones we have enough material to have more than one taxa in. Meanwhile, the Spinosaurines are spread all up and down it, potentially meaning they had a lot of more varied types of diets, or at least varied feeding mechanisms. They then did a PCA, or Principal Component Analysis, which is basically just a way of taking a really large data set and making it much more simple and condensed. And you can see the results of that here with these different blobs showing different colors for where different groups would have actually lined up. And importantly in here, they also added the megalosaurs, which are likely very closely related to the spinosaurs. In fact, it's even been suggested that the spinosaurids may have evolved directly out of the megalosaurs, although there still needs to be a lot of taxonomic work done on that specific hypothesis. You can see the green and orange blobs in here, that's the Spinosaurines and the Baryonychines, and they overlap quite a bit. And the Megalosaurines actually do plot slightly outside of that, but really importantly, never cross the x-axis, meaning they're not really getting into the kind of tooth shape that you see in modern day crocodilians, or importantly, gharials. Gharials are very long snouted crocodilians. And really importantly, they have a lot of small teeth and mostly eat fish. However, they also get up to 20 feet long, so pushing six meters. This means they'll also just eat whatever else they can happen to grab. But they also don't process food the same way that you see in things like Nile crocodiles, where they'll hold a large prey item and do a death roll in order to pull off chunks of it. None of these fossil groups, though, really aligns that closely with what we see in crocodiles or alligators, though which there is sure some overlap, but not nearly to the same amount that we would see in something like the gharial, which again, lots of very fine, small teeth for catching relatively small prey, as opposed to catching prey larger than itself or of similar sizes. The same kind of PCA analysis was also done on the overall jaw shape in order to better understand where those might actually plot when compared to modern day crocodilian jaw shapes. What they found is actually pretty interesting because at least in some parts, the Spinosaurines and the Baryonychines do line up fairly close to one another, and at least somewhat close to alligatorids and crocodilians. But that's only the lower jaw. That's only half the story. When you look at the upper jaw, Spinosaurines in particular are very, very different in their overall morphology, plotting nowhere near anything else. The Baryonychines do plot fairly close to the alligatorids though. Really the kind of visual depiction on the sides of this graph is really what's useful because it really helps to show the entire story, with the massive dip in the pre-maxilla of the Spinosaurines and the rosette at the tip of the snout being easily seen as the most important parts of their morphospace. This then leads to the most simple image of all in the paper, and that's because it's two photos of two skulls, one Baryonychine and one Spinosaurine, with each of the major differences highlighted. You have the length of that kind of gap in the base of the pre-maxilla, the sizes of the teeth as well as their numbers and positions, there's also the curvature at the tip of the lower jaw and the number of teeth in the back portion of the jaw. 
What this likely means with the larger teeth and larger rosette when Spinosaurians is they were likely dealing with more aggressive and faster moving, or at least more aggressively moving prey when you're considering that they need to pin that prey down at the tip of their snout and really hold it down. That said, in the Baryonychines, they still have a rosette, even if not as pronounced. So they were still targeting prey with the tip of their snout in order to catch it that was fairly nimble, but not necessarily things that would have been as able to fight back. This makes sense with previous research that has suggested that spinosaurian skulls were slightly more resistant to torquing forces than what we see in baryonychines. So essentially, if they were holding a larger prey item there and it was trying to twist its way out, the skull of a spinosaurian would be more resistant to that and more able to pin large, more active prey down. The baryonychines, though, do have more teeth, like you see in things like the gharials. Gharials have the most teeth out of any known modern crocodilian. And with that in mind, that also means baryonychines, again, would be really good at processing small prey. You can really see the kind of ecologies, or at least feeding mechanisms that are proposed in this figure, where you have the baryonychine grabbing something fairly small, not really having to deal with it, trying to fling itself around, and then being able to eat it fairly easily. Meanwhile, in Spinosaurians, you have a larger fish that it catches in this image, although probably didn't just eat fish, and that fish is able to try and pivot and turn around, but Spinosaurians have the adaptations to be able to handle that kind of torsion. The skull morphology of Spinosaurians also supports this, with these larger teeth and that large gap in teeth near the front of the mouth. What this means is if they did capture a prey item at the tip of the snout, if it was fighting, it could go backwards pretty easily into that gap. However, past that gap are much larger, more robust teeth, right near the axis of essentially where the jaws actually close, meaning there'd be more force at the back of the jaw than at the front of the jaw. What this means is that could be used for processing larger prey that couldn't be swallowed all at once. This would also be aided by the large hands of things like Spinosaurus, where if you're thinking about it being able to process its prey, it's not going to be able to do a death roll the same way you see in crocodilians. Instead, it's probably going to have to dispatch and process this prey in a different way. And with its large arms, it could potentially do this while wading in the water by just standing up, using its claws to help pin prey to its chest, and then moving that prey with its hands up to the head. And we think about Spinosaurians as having very quick rapid strikes to capture prey. Their necks are built in an S-shaped pattern so that it can strike forward very rapidly. Those same neck muscles probably could be used to bite onto something that it's holding in its hands and pull away very hard to take it apart. And if we're thinking about the waiting hypothesis, it would be able to do this in the water as opposed to needing to use its feet to pin prey the way we expect in other large theropods. Think of something like Tyrannosaurus rex. It's not using its hands to hold down prey and help process prey. It's probably using its feet to hold it down while its head does the rest of the work. What this means is baryonychines are probably pretty comparable in their overall feeding strategy and kind of prey they're targeting as gharials. Although, again, they're still much larger, so they could eat things on land as well. We even have fossils of a baryonyx with parts of a young iguanodon in its stomach. They could eat plenty of different things. Meanwhile, with the Spinosaurians, they're probably more comparable to something like Tomisome, or the false Gario. Its snout isn't quite as long, however, it still does eat largely small prey, including fish, but it will take hard prey from the land, or even just larger prey from the land, if the opportunity arises. They're very opportunistic, and if you're thinking about something as large as even Baryonyx, but also Spinosaurus, they're going to be opportunistic. They don't really have the opportunity to try and pick and choose their prey because they're so large they need a lot of food for that metabolism. Unfortunately though, when you're thinking back to that question I mentioned at the beginning, were they waiting or were they actually diving after prey, it's hard to say based on this paper. It doesn't really address any of those kinds of traits that would have helped it one way or the other. It was just looking at how the jaws would have functioned, and from what it seems like, again, they were mostly targeting relatively small prey, at least compared to other theropods, but Spinosaurians could process slightly larger prey. So we're slowly building a better idea of what was happening with the Spinosaurians and the Baryonychines on that note, but we still need some better fossils to really narrow it down, and hopefully we'll get some. I know there's some new material that's been found, but it's basically just been, hey, we found this. Not much more beyond that, so hopefully we'll get some more information about that in the near future.